This is the eLearn Podcast. If you're passionate about the future of learning, you're in the right place. The expert guests on this show provide insights into the latest strategies, practices, and technologies for creating killer online learning outcomes. My name's Ladek, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. The eLearning Podcast is sponsored by the eLearn Success Series, a uniquely valuable set of events that bring together sector experts and thought leaders to offer solutions to the most critical challenges and issues at the intersection of education and technology. Get your free ticket to all four sessions at eLearnSuccessSeries.com. And Open LMS a company that provides world-class LMS solutions that empower organizations to meet education and workplace learning needs. Learn more by visiting openlms.net. Hello, everyone. My name is Lanik, and my guest for today is Michael Phillips, who is the Associate Professor of Digital Transformation at Monash University. Now, this is a really important special episode for me because it's a humanitarian conversation about giving back, about providing something for those in need through the vector of education. And I really encourage you to listen to the whole thing because Mike and I talk about, first we start with Monash University itself, which is a part of the group of eight research intensive universities in Australia with the largest and most comprehensive faculty of education. And I believe Michael is, it's number 12 in the world. We also talk about what digital transformation means for Michael in his career personally and the future of education writ large. We also talk about the origins, evolution, and current status of an initiative that Monash is spearheading to deliver education virtually to students displaced by the war in Ukraine and how this initiative leverages technology, student teachers, and a ton of goodwill to literally change the lives of thousands of people every day now, right now. We also talk about Michael's perspectives on why the programs developed by Monash result in students and teachers that rave about online learning, other than, you know, not, which is the opposite of what so many people have put in the news and what, right? And the hint here is, is that you have to completely rethink how you're delivering as a teacher. We also talk about how the program at Monash is funded so that it can operate at scale. Who's supporting it? And it's a shout out to David Falcon and Smart Osvita. We talk about both of them in the podcast. In other ways and how you can participate as well. We also talk about what future additions and evolutions look like for the Monash program with things like psychosocial support and credentialing and many other things. And then finally, Mike and I round out our conversation around the reason why providing a space where structured education happens is so incredibly different than just having access to information and why it's more critical than ever in today's world. Now, before we get started, I also just want to remind you that we record this podcast live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern or New York time so that we can interact with you, our audience, in real time. So I'd really, I, you know, I invite you, come join us every week at Tuesday at 1 p.m. on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. Just go over to elearnmagazine.com and subscribe and you'll never miss an episode. Now, I give you Michael Phillips. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the eLearn podcast. My name is Ladek. I am from a company called OpenLMS. And um, you know, I'm really excited to have you here today because this is a very special conversation. One that, you know, honestly, I didn't necessarily see coming, although now that I kind of know about it and I understand it a little bit, it makes a lot of sense. It, it you know, it connects a lot of the worlds I've been a part of, which is really fantastic just from a personal point of view. But it's it's also a conversation that I think is really, really neat in terms of the fact that, um, you know, it's about education, which is already an awesome thing. It's about leveraging the future, which is today, which is the technology that we have for something amazing. And then it's really about how can we use that to support people in need, which is, you know, part of you know, my universe. And I think a universe that a lot, a lot of people care about all the time, but this isn't about me. This is about my guest today, which is uh, Dr. Mike Phillips. And I, I had to call you doctor. Sorry. That just, you know, I know that's not your preference, but Michael Phillips, um, I'm going to look now just to make sure I have it correct, but you are an associate professor of digital transformation at Monash University uh, on the other side of the planet for me right now. I'm in Mexico and you are in Melbourne, Australia. 
Melbourne, Australia. This is where technology just gets so cool. I mean, we're having this conversation in real time. So, you know, tell us about you. Tell, introduce Monash University. Introduce yourself and and kind of what you do there and so what, what Monash might be might be might be known for in Australia. So, so Monash is one of what's called a group of eight universities in Australia. So there are eight big research intensive universities in Australia. Uh, and I am uh, part of the Faculty of Education here. We are the largest and most comprehensive Faculty of Education uh, in Australia, and we're ranked number 12 in the world. Uh, so we have a lot of students uh, do things at scale, and we're really proud to do them to do them really, really well. You know, so my, yeah. mm -hmm. go Sorry, on. Go ahead. No, no, I, I was going to say, you know, I actually was, you know, obviously stalking you and Monash before this. And, everything, and I saw a quote from you that I, I believe it was from you that said, you know, most people don't realize in Australia that the, one of the largest institutions is actually one that nobody ever shows up to. You know, I think it's right. like 5,500 students or something like that, right? That That's for a, a school here in uh, in Melbourne. Um, it's actually run by, by our state government. So our state uh, governments run education systems in this country. And, and so um, the largest school in this state is run uh, by the government and it's a fully online school. Yeah, as you said, with over five and a half thousand students. And, and so, you know, this, this uh, pervasiveness of technologies into education has reached a point where uh, it's, it's shaping the daily lives of, of literally tens of thousands of young people um, mm. around, around this country and, and certainly hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Of course. So, uh, and I, I cut you off there before you explained exactly what you do. What does digital transformations mean uh, for for you in particular? Well, that's a that's a really good question, and and we could go into a whole range of different areas. But my my journey, I guess, started. I was actually a, a secondary school teacher and principal for fifteen years before I came to Monash, and it was during that time that we started to see a lot of digital technologies coming into classrooms, particularly one one to one technologies. So started off with laptops, but then kind of moved into phones and, and tablet devices and those kinds of things. And I became really fascinated because I was able to work with a number of colleagues and there were these really polarizing uh, reactions to technologies in, in classrooms. Some teachers saying, give me more of this. I love it. I just want more and more. Anything that was new, they wanted to be a part of. And other teachers were saying, get this away from me and, and, and sort of trying to hold back the digital tide as it were. And, and so I was fascinated that in, in this one school, I was seeing this huge range of different responses to technologies. And so I wanted to find out more about why that was the case, about what happens when you put technologies into a room with young people and teachers. And so that's really what brought me to Monash and, and continues to shape my work today. So I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm, I'm no good with technology. If the, if the microwave clock needs resetting or something needs recording on the television, don't ask me to do it. I'm completely useless. But I'm fascinated with what happens. When, when people try to work in an educational sense with technologies and, and how that shapes and, and, and changes the way uh, teachers work with students and students work with students. Can I go out on a limb and say that maybe that's a portion of why you may be successful in that you're, un, you know, you're, you're kind of unable to get lost in the weeds of you know, the code or the way things connect or those kinds of things and, and rather you know, your passion for it says, look, let's, let's make it, let's make it happen. Or let's, let's, let's discover it, or let's test it, or let's try it, or let's see how we build something that, that people like myself can use. Does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it, it does to, to some extent. I, I guess I'm really lucky that I'm able to, to surround myself with really great people who, who I'll come up with a crazy idea and they'll say, oh, I'm not sure. And I'll kind of go, well, if we were able to put people on the moon, I'm sure we could probably do this. There's got to be a way. <laughs> Um, and, and I just kind of in my naive way, just walk out and hope that they're able to, to do things. And, and generally they do that. Yeah. You know, I've got, I've got so many amazing people, um, that, Fantastic. That like to work with. Yeah. Hey there. Thanks again for joining me for this episode of the Ethern podcast. I'm jumping in here quickly to request that if you like what you're hearing, if it's valuable, if it's fun, if it's informative, you know, if, you, if you're really enjoying what's going on, please do me the favor of subscribing to the podcast on your favorite player. Whatever you're using now, just, just hit subscribe. And I encourage you to join my future conversations live every week on YouTube, Facebook, or my LinkedIn feed. Thanks in advance. And now back to the show. Well, let's let's talk about those amazing people because that's part of the story that we want to tell here is that you in Australia 
um, you know, are sort of the spearhead for an initiative to help people who are uh, help specifically students who um, are unable to attend their schools in the Ukraine right now because obviously the war is going on. Um, there's thousands, millions, millions of people are displaced uh, and, you know, they've gone to the borders or they've, they're in hiding or they're in bomb shelters or these kinds of things. Tell me, you know, I want to get to the crescendo of, wow, this is happening. But where did it start? Like, how did yeah, I believe that when we, you and I talked a couple of weeks ago when we were kind of teeing this up, you said that it, you, it, you almost had like an engine that was waiting for a reason to be used or something like that. But, and I'm not sure what that whole story is. Yeah, well, it started a long, long way from from where we're at now. It, it actually started uh, back in early 2020 at the at the start of the, the little pandemic that we had, and um, we were in a situation where we had a, a lot of pre-service teachers, people studying to become teachers, and mm. part of the requirement for them is to spend time teaching young people in schools under the guidance of a registered teacher. Um, Obviously, with the pandemic, schools were shutting down at a great rate of knots and teachers were pivoting to, to online teaching and learning and and no schools were in a position to be able to take our pre-service teachers quite understandably. They were busy just trying to work out how to how to keep things rolling along and they didn't have the time or capacity to be to be supporting the learning needs of, of our pre-service teachers. So we were in a position where we had a number of, of uh, people who were due to graduate mid-year and, and they needed placement days fairly quickly. So um, again, probably in my naive and, and simplistic way, I said, well, why don't we just set up our own school and make it an online school? And people like myself are still registered teachers. We can supervise our pre-service teachers teaching online. Let's just call it the Monash Virtual School and, and go from there. And, mm. and so I was actually talking with a, a great friend and colleague in, in Arizona. His name's Punya Mishra. Um, and he had done a, a not dissimilar thing. I guess a lot of universities around the world were, were facing similar challenges. His his approach was was slightly different. I asked if I could steal the kernel of the idea and morph and change it, and he was really on board with that and loved the idea. And and so we uh, started out teaching. Uh, well, I, I didn't teach. The pre-service teachers were teaching um, physics and, and chemistry classes online uh, because that's where the, the need was for our students. And uh, what we found was that there was this uh, huge number of, of uh, students at the end of their, their secondary, their high schooling, that were coming along to these free revision classes. Mm. Uh, they were interactive, the, the pre-service teachers were team teaching them. The students who came along got a huge amount out of it. Our pre-service teachers were just loving the experience. And so for a couple of years, we just continued to, to do that. Uh, throughout the pandemic, and and can I'd I like to can say I can I pause you right there before you even give another yeah. shout out? Is that I want to highlight the fact that you've now said over the last you know, three to four minutes how many times the students were getting so much out of it. The you know then the, there was energy, there was engagement, there was value, but then also the teachers were like really loving the platform and doing that. <clears throat> I you know I I hate to say it to you, I, I, even as a person who works in this in this business, I, I we've heard nothing you know the the, the the volume has been around the gripes of, you know, people not getting their needs and teachers not really loving platforms and these kinds of things. What do you think was different about what you did? Uh, was it just the demographic of the, the, the sort of the pre-service teachers and you know, sort of these secondary students? Or was there something special about the platform you used or anything like that? There's nothing special about the platform that we used. Absolutely. It was it was pretty simple. Um, but essentially one of the things that that we said right off the bat to our pre-service teachers was that this is not a lecture. This is not you talking at students. There has to be interaction. There has to be an opportunity or multiple opportunities for students to be able to engage and interact with you. You have to be able to check for student understanding. All of these kinds of, of mantras that we sort of had underpinned what we see as being effective and engaging online teaching. Um, one of the challenges I think that caught a lot of uh, educators off guard was that they hadn't really looked into what it means to, to teach in an engaging and effective way online. And so essentially what a lot of people tried to do is just replicate what they do in a classroom in an online setting. And, and it just doesn't work that way. I mean, I've been researching and teaching into this kind of space for the last more than a decade. And so a lot of those kinds of ideas have become second nature to me. But, but even simple things like 
uh, research that's been going on for a couple of decades now shows that it takes people 25% longer on average to read something on a screen compared to on a printed page. No now, kidding. I, yeah. Now, I don't see most teachers giving kids 25% longer to read stuff on a screen. In I'd fact, say it's the probably, exact opposite. Exactly. Yeah. So once you start to understand the ways in which we might be able to design for really effective online teaching and learning about how we can actually leverage technologies rather than um, have them working against us, then I think we're able to actually overcome a lot of those those kinds of things. Unfortunately, a, a lot of teachers just didn't have the opportunity at the beginning of the pandemic to spend time reading up on this kind of stuff, redesigning their materials. It was just like, nope, we've got to hit the ground running. It's Monday morning and I've got to do something. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that goes a long way to explaining the kinds of experiences that that you were kind of describing. But the school, which is called Virtual School Victoria that I mentioned that has the largest enrollment here in Victoria, um, those teachers do things in a very, very different way to the kind of rapid shift or pivot to online learning that, that we saw, that thoughtful, engaged, planned, um, uh, intentional use of technologies over a long period of time looks and feels really different to other mm. kinds of experiences. I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing it right now. We need to connect to somebody there to, to have that conversation about how they do it differently. But, um, we'll, 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 we'll have that conversation afterwards. Take me, you know, I think you were, I, I kind of cut you off in the middle of a, in the middle of the story yeah. there, just to, cause that just really stood out to me, the, the, the positive experience, which is absolutely fantastic. So take me, where were you, where were you going from there? So, so essentially we've been doing this for, for a couple of years with, with these biology and chemistry classes. And I'd like to say that we were running them on the smell of an oily rag, but we didn't have <laughs> enough money for oil or a rag. So we were just doing the <laughs> yeah. line, you know, we're just making it work. Um, and then uh, a fantastic uh, philanthropic organization called the Invergauri Foundation heard about uh, our work and came and had a bit of a conversation and said, well, so what would this look like if if we gave you a little bit of money? And so leading into to this year, um, they were very generous with their support and, and gave us the opportunity to expand. They've got a, a particular focus on supporting disadvantaged girls and young women who are interested mm -hmm. in studying STEM subjects. And so we were able to expand to the full range of STEM subjects that are offered it for um, at the end of high school exams. And so we uh, have run, we're just about to finish up because uh, our, our school year runs from, from like February to December. So we're getting pretty close to the end. We will have run 56 classes this year. We have unlimited spaces in those classes. And we've had just over 25,000 places booked in those this oh year. Oh, my Lord, 25,000. Yeah. That's amazing. So, so, so there's this real palpable sense that that young people want to can want to engage in in really positive educational experiences and opportunities, and uh, and so our pre service teachers have have risen to the occasion, and you know they've been been thrown a few curveballs along the way. How how do you actually effectively deal with a class where you got five hundred students enrolled in that one that one session? And the mantra of uh, engagement, interaction, checking for student understanding, none of those have changed. How do you do that at scale? So I've got a fantastic uh, group of people, particularly a, a, a wonderful lady by the name of Tara Mannix, who does a huge amount of work in terms of coaching and supporting um, those pre-service teachers and, and providing them with amazing feedback to, to allow them to do that. Anyway, the, the Invergary Foundation um, were wondering how things were going. So we had another conversation and they said, that's, that's fantastic. What would it look like if we gave you a bit more money? So we've been really fortunate to secure a very, very generous donation from them, which will keep us going for the next seven years, will allow us to expand our secondary program, but also allow us to run an elementary or primary school program uh, from next year. And so us being able to do things at scale kind of leads us into the to the Ukraine story. Sure. Um, okay. So we had sort of become a, a bit noticed because of, of the the scale at which we were doing these kinds of things and and the breadth of, of which we were able to do them. And so uh, I received a, a fantastic email one morning from a lovely, lovely man in Canada. His name is is David Falconer, and he's a, a school principal uh, in, a, in a school above the Arctic Circle. And um, he 
reached out to me and he said um, that he had responded to an email that he'd seen from uh, a non-government organization in Ukraine called Smart Ozvita. Uh, and they um, had been working in Ukraine to, to try to upgrade and update the education system in Ukraine for about six years. And then um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine occurred. And like we had to with the pandemic, all of a sudden, teaching and learning had to look really, really different in Ukraine to, mm -hmm. to maintain educational continuity. The idea was that, well, we could try to do this online. Um, but the challenges, obviously, doing that in a conflict zone are immeasurably larger than the, the challenges that we faced in, in trying to do this in the pandemic. And so David had volunteered to, so Smart Vita had asked teachers around the world if they had an hour or two to spare that they might volunteer some of their time to run an online Zoom class. It could be about anything. Um, and so David volunteered his time and had an incredibly moving experience um, working with young people uh, displaced in Ukraine. And so he got back in touch with the Smart Vita team and said, well, if there's anything else I can can do, I'm, I'm very happy to volunteer more of my time and my energies. What can I do to help? And so David has been remarkable in terms of his commitment to this to this effort, and um, he does so so much work. And, um, mm. and anyway, David reached out to me because it was largely him trying by himself to do a lot of things, and he was asking for some help and support based on some of the things that we've been able to do here. And that's how in, our involvement with with the Ukraine program uh, came about. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, I just I, this story just gets better and better as it goes on. I mean, it was a, a kernel of idea that turned into success that, you know, continued to get funding and it grew. And it just kind of I, I love that it I want to say it, 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 it seems obvious in hindsight, right, that, you know, if you if you do great work and you actually you're creating value and people are engaged and you know whatever you're doing it's just a no brainer for a fund like the one that you mentioned says, Hey, you know what? You, this is really working. Let's, let's put, let's invest more in it. Right. Um, and it's, it's even more heartening that it's just, you know, uh, there isn't a profit motive there, right? This is a, this is a, this is an educational motive, which is absolutely fantastic. Then to stumble into the opportunity of uh, helping these individuals, which, you know, it's really interesting because most of the time we think about the students, but also these teachers that haven't been able to do anything and whatnot. Have you, is there, is there both a connection? I want to get to the, how did we even find students in Ukraine? How do you let them know about, like, I want to know, like, like, how do you even, how do they even start raising their hand and get, you know, get the link to join that kind of thing? Um, let's, let's go there first. So like, so smart. Oh, Osvita. Oh, Osvita. Yeah. So smart Osvita, they were already working in the, you know, they were already connected. Right. They became a part of this sort of process, this program that you have. Take us from there. Like, how does not, not, like how do the logistics work on this thing? So that that's thank thank goodness for David. That's where David comes in a, a lot of the time. So David David has had a lot of very early mornings and a lot of very late nights, um, and, and cold at being in the Arctic. So it's, it's, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so so we've done in in terms of logistics, um, we have about three hundred and fifty uh, people here um, who volunteer from from uh, largely from Victoria, but from around Australia who volunteer into the, to, to teach into that program. And was that, um, is that just a no brainer when you, when you said, Hey, some, would somebody like to volunteer to just people just come in droves or. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we, we, we put a call out to, to all of our pre-service teachers to say, we think that this is a really valuable uh, opportunity. Would you like to be involved? If so, here's a link, just sign up. Uh, within 24 hours, we had like 150 of them. It's wow. just like the yeah education community is just extraordinary, mm -hmm. um, but but up until now um, David has been doing a lot of that work um, liaising with Smartos Vita, but a lot of it's been done in a in a relatively sort of manual uh, labor intensive kind of a way. Um, one of the the fantastic things that we have been incredibly fortunate to do is to to uh, connect with with Open LMS. Who have been incredibly generous in their support as well, in providing um, infrastructure to to be able to allow some of that kind of work to become a bit more automated and and scalable. Um, without without that support, to be honest, I, I don't know how much longer this program would have been sustainable in the way that it was structured. Um, we were all kind of hoping that the way things were going, that 
maybe there might be an opportunity for for the Ukrainian education system to kind of half get back on its feet and 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 sort of be able to to carry a bit of that load but that's just not looking like that's going to be the no. case for some time yet so uh, once that realization came into into being that we were actually going to be in this for a, unfortunately uh, a much longer haul than, than we had initially anticipated um we were we were very fortunate to be able to connect with with the wonderful people at Open LMS who who have supplied infrastructure that, as I said, will not only enable um, through through things like Moodle to be able to be able to advertise this information more easily to to students, but to also be able to schedule classes, to be able to provide asynchronous learning materials, all of those kinds of things, which up until now haven't necessarily been much of a feature of the program. Mm. But recognizing that that this has got some way to go to play out, we're certainly going to need um, that kind of support and and resourcing, and um, and so we're just incredibly grateful for for all the support that that we've received. Fantastic! That and you know I we have to say I mean it is a plug. I do work for Open LMS. That's great. But I lo- I'd love to hear that my colleagues were the ones that reached out and said yes. You know we you know we're we're happy to raise Absolutely. our hand to do this. So take like I'd like to get in just a little bit of the nuts and bolts, like I was mentioning earlier about you know when Smart Otiva. Uh, once the connection all started to happen, like how did they reach out to students in these, especially in the places that are where, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, migrants or refugees on the border, displaced people, you know, and where, you know, they used to be in a school district. Now we don't even know where to find them. You know, uh, th- these kinds of like, how does that, how does that work? Do they just have a huge informal network or, or what, what is it? So as, as I mentioned before, um, They've been working in Ukraine for a number of years before the war, so so they're they're very embedded and well connected um, mm-hmm. within Ukraine, um, and so essentially um, a little bit, it's not dissimilar, I guess, to uh, the way that people find out about the stuff that we do here at Monash with the Monash Virtual School. We don't advertise for places largely. This is all just essentially word of mouth through connections, teachers talking to teachers, those kinds of of um, I believe word of mouth is the best form of, of, of advertising. If people mm-hmm. love what you're doing and 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 appreciate um, what you're offering, then they're going to tell people like-minded people, and and largely that's what sort of happened in Ukraine. Um, and so word is spread, and um, we have uh, uh, thousands of of young people attending classes each week. Often um, they're accompanied by their mums um, because their fathers are uh, unfortunately off fighting. Um, and so uh, as much as it is an intellectual opportunity uh, for these young people, it's also an opportunity for some intellectual respite for both mums and their kids as well. An opportunity just to step out of, you know, that day-to-day kind of horrific situation that they find themselves in and and just have an interesting conversation with somebody else from from somewhere else in the world. So, mm. you know, we, we yes, we do run uh, academic classes, um, but there are certainly a number of other classes um, where it's it's more like a conversation with with somebody who's interested in in talking to young people and and wants to share something about their lives. I could see a huge so kind of two questions. One, is there a vision for providing sort of uh, you know a a, a a degree path, a you know a, a a diploma path kind of thing because obviously this, this thing looks like it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And so, you know, a, a high schooler could literally use, lose three, four years of their, their schooling, you know, and this is an opportunity to not do that. But then I'll, a second question there is, is there a vision maybe just to, to provide like those psychosocial support kind of services and mental health services and those kinds of things as well? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of supporting people who volunteer their time, um, we actually provide them Um, with opportunities around online pedagogical practices. So there's a whole, if they want to, there's a whole course that they can can go and do that I've set up. I've got a fantastic colleague who uh, has also provided a whole range of different resources around trauma-informed educational practices. So so the teachers, the educationalists who go into to work and volunteer in these spaces, they're really well supported already. We have that side of things taken care of. In terms of putting a more holistic um, series of, of wraparounds around the education that you're sort of describing. Absolutely, that's that's something that we're working on at the moment. One of, um, Monash has has three 
uh, they're calling them challenges of the age, um, which we're focused on over the next 10 years. And one of those is around geopolitical security. Mm. And so this project absolutely fits into into addressing some of those kinds of challenges. And, and one of the things that we're working on at the moment is trying to understand how we might be able to, for example, provide some micro-credentialing opportunities potentially for young people who are involved in our education programs, how we can use the Monash name to be able to, to uh, provide some sort of credentials, mm -hmm. um, to be able to allow young people to continue an educational journey because the last thing that, that we want to do is, is say, well, we can support you up to this point and then after that, well, too bad you're on your own. Right. Um, we're, we are absolutely committed to this in, in the long haul. And so um, understandably that there are a number of challenges around doing that kind of thing and, and being able to get that recognised. But that's absolutely something, you know, front of mind in terms of, of, of where we're going with this. Similarly, in terms of, of providing educational infrastructure to allow this to, to occur, and, and I'm going beyond just providing people with a device but providing people with safe spaces mm -hmm. to be able to be educated in, providing the kinds of social supports that, that you were talking about, um, ideas around, you know, in, in other parts of the world where we're already seeing and, and it's only going to accelerate displaced people because of things like climate change. So issues of, of food security and energy security and all of those kinds of issues are ones that all of a sudden I find myself involved in conversations in thinking how on earth did a secondary school teacher, high school teacher from Melbourne get involved in these kind of conversations? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, they're, but, they're, but they're real and they're important. And if we're going to do this work and if we're going to, uh, like the assumptions that we have about the way our world works now are certainly not going to be the assumptions that are going to underpin our society when there are 10 billion people on this planet in 2050. Well, so I, just, you know, I, I, I just, I just, I, my mind is just going absolutely a thousand miles an hour right now just simply because I, i'm i what i find really fascinating is it's like it's such a it's a huge victory in i mean and i mean that in the most generous way to say look hey here's this horrific thing that's happening in ukraine and yet you know there's a real victory here because we say look we can we can find a way around this uh, for these people who've been displaced, for these people who can't, right? Like, I mean, I live here in Mexico. It's the largest migration corridor in the world, right? And so the opportunities that you're describing right now for people who are looking for opportunity, you know, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of those people are genuine and just say, look, I just want to find a way to a better life for, you know, for my kids, for whatnot. And so what you're describing is, you know, how are we, how are the services that we provide in the world shifting and evolving uh, so that we meet those needs is, is absolutely incredible and it's just blowing my mind right now. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and then the thing that completely blows my mind is when you look at the number of, of young people who are displaced around the world because of, of conflict, oh, yeah. it's one, one, one in six young people in the world. Like just think about it. one in six young people in the world are displaced because of conflict. That's just, that's just mind-blowing to me. It's really that I, I want to just pause and let that sort of sink in for a second because it's the year, almost the year 2023. Why is this, why is this a thing? Like I, I, the fact that you and I are talking right now across, you know, half the planet, like we all, we all, you know, we have a lot more in common than we do not. Right. So. Right. Right. And yeah. so, so all of the, the, those kinds of challenges that you're talking about sort of feed, once you start to think about this at scale, once you start to think about, you know, how are we going to do this for millions and millions of young people around the world, not just thousands, but millions, then all of a sudden we we have a challenge on our hands. And, um, you know, again, I'll, I'll go back to my naivety uh, in terms of at least the digital side of things. I, I just refuse to believe that we can't do this at, mm -hmm. at scale and, and in, a, in a meaningful and personalized and engaging way. It's not just providing people with access to information because education is way more than information. Sure. So, I mean. so how, how do we do that at scale? Well, that's the, the next thing that I'm going to be working on. And I also want, I want to compliment you on the, that, that, that last piece that you just said there where it's, you know, it, these people in Ukraine who are displaced, these are 
these are savvy people, right? They've got, they've got smartphones, they have internet connections, they have, you know, they have access to inter- information, right? I mean, it, YouTube exists everywhere, right? Uh, you know, and so that, but, but the education experience, the mentorship experience, the apprenticeships, the, the connection, the peer learning, the, you know, the space to try and, you know, receive feedback, I mean, I could, I, I could just, you know, continue to enumerate all of the different things that access to information doesn't, doesn't cover, right? No, exactly. So it's, it's, it's one of those, those things that, that if we truly believe that, that in a, in a form of education, um, I do believe that we can do that in an online setting. It's going to look different and it needs to look different to what it does in a bricks and mortar kind of school. But I refuse to believe that we can't do it. Um, and, you know, going back to, to virtual school, Victoria, um, there are five and a half thousand young people in Victoria alone who choose to go there, not just because it's convenient, but some who have chronic health conditions, some who have particular social emotional needs, some who are amazing, um, performers or musicians or, or actors for whatever reason, the bricks and mortar form of schooling just doesn't work for them. And so if we don't, I don't, I'm not suggesting for a moment that online education is the be all and end all and should be the only way that we provide educational opportunity for young people. But if we don't have it as an option within education systems, then I think we have a very impoverished system and one where people will simply miss out through Mm -hmm. no fault of their own. Fantastic. Mike, we've taken a half an hour here of your time and I know you're a busy man, but I like, I want to give you the opportunity here at the end. How can, you know, if I'm listening right now, how can I help? How can I contribute? What can I, what can I do to, to get involved? Well, if, if you're an educator um, uh, and you know, you, you might be retired, you might be a pre-service teacher, you might be working in schools or early childhood centers, whatever it happens to be, we would love to hear from you. We, we have a, an opportunity. Uh, it's on the screen just now. There's a, 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 a uh, call to action there where you can actually register. We'll get in touch with you and provide you with uh, access to the resources that I was mentioning in terms of, you know, great online educational uh, opportunity to, to teach uh, and how you do that really well, but also around trauma-informed practice. Um, David, my fantastic colleague in Canada, will provide you with an orientation session to, to show you how everything works. And um, and you can volunteer, you know, an hour of your time or as long as you like to, to work with young people, not just in Ukraine, but we've also now just started a program uh, working with with young children in Myanmar as well, who are also impacted because of, of regime change there. So um, if, you, if you'd like to work with, with young people in, in various parts of the world, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if, if you're sitting out there and, and you're thinking, well, you'd like to, to help support this in some other way and, and potentially um, provide us with some support to be able to expand this into, into other conflict zones or address some of the other kinds of challenges, um, then we'd also love to hear from you. Have you talked to UNICEF? Have you talked to like, I mean, I, I know we're live here and we're just talking about like, I just like I, my knowledge of the NGO and, you know, international humanitarian world is a little, little deeper than most people. I'm just wondering maybe you just haven't had the time. I mean, like you've set this thing up and whatnot, but this just seems like barely scratching the surface of the number of organizations that would be like raising their hand to say, yes, please, we need this. Yeah. I mean, UNICEF do amazing work. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, there are a range of different foundations doing, doing different things. But I think that the thing that probably will hopefully sets us apart is the fact that, that we're doing this from a research evidence informed base that, mm. that we have a, a rationale and, and a reason for doing this and, and we can, clearly and openly share that with with everybody but we can also do this at scale we we have the infrastructure to be able to do it we've shown that we can do it we just mm. we just need a bit more support to be able to, yeah, to my, I, but i meant i i meant i i'm i meant that in, in, a, in a complimentary way i think that those organizations like you know they, they would say look we we'd love for you to come do this because we have these great needs i'm just thinking sri lanka i'm thinking venezuela i'm thinking you know so many places where just you know the situation on the ground is, is not conducive to, you know, a normal education system, but great. Well, so we have, so I'm just going to read it out so people can see it. it's, it's Monash, which is M O N A S H dot E D U forward slash education. And that will get you to Mike Phillips or someone uh, who will be happy yeah. to, you know, uh, connect you with, with all of those things and, and maybe they can contribute. So. Fantastic. Fantastic. Maybe that'll come straight through to me and I'll, I'll look forward to hearing from you. 
Awesome. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to, to tell us about this initiative. Um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, I wish you all the best. And um, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to a, a follow up conversation. Um, hopefully, where we'll be talking about, you know, how you get to wind down the program uh, in parts of the world. But, you know, we'll also hear about how you're scaling it up in other parts, uh, you know, to, to help more people. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Have a great day. You too. Bye now. Thanks again for joining me for the eLearn podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Just just push subscribe on your player right now. And remember, you can join the conversation live on YouTube, Facebook, and my LinkedIn feed every week. I hope to see you there. Thanks.